Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to Framework Leadership, a podcast about principles and ideas you can use today to take your leadership to the next level. I'm your host, Kent Engel, president of Southeastern University. I'm your co-host, Michael Steiner, vice president for innovation. And we're excited today to introduce our guest on the show, Congresswoman Virginia Fox. Congresswoman Fox represents North Carolina's 5th District in the United States House of Representatives. She also serves as the Republican leader of the House Committee on Education and Labor. Prior to serving on Capitol Hill, Congresswoman Fox uh, also spent 10 years in the North Carolina Carolina Senate, uh, and you uh, have uh, uh, worked in higher ed, so you're very familiar with all that. So we welcome you to the show. Great to have you with us. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your inviting me to come to the campus. We want to open our conversation by uh, talking about your passion um, for the judicial system and the legal landscape of our country. When did you first realize this was a career path that you felt uh, you wanted to go down? Well, I grew up extremely poor in the mountains of North Carolina. So my goal when I was a high school student, uh, actually in my senior year, was to go to college. At the last minute, I was encouraged by a teacher to do that and become a high school English teacher. Mm. But um, I was very poor. I worked hard, could not do student teaching. So I wound up getting a degree in English. And then I had a chance to go back and get a master's in college teaching. And I did that in sociology. And it wasn't until I was living, we were living in Boone at the time, and I went to a school board meeting as an observer for the League of Women Voters. And the school board was being particularly incompetent one night. And somebody turned around to me and said, why don't you run for the school board? And I said, oh, no, I'm not qualified. Well, I had a master's in college teaching. I was working at Appalachian as an administrator, and I had a child in school. And I went home, and I said to my husband, who's really the political person in the family, Ron Hester said I suggested I should run for school board. He said, I think you should. So I ran, and I lost. Mm. Uh, But I ran again two years later, and I won big, big time. And I was pleased to be on the school board. I did it for 12 years. Mm. Then I did some work for our, a Republican governor. I was deputy secretary for administration in Raleigh and was beginning then to get into the political world. And then I became the president of a community college. Mm-hmm. And um, my board of trustees became very, very political <clears throat> and uh, was giving me a hard time. And I had taken on a very bad school and turned it into a school that was chosen as the best community college in the country Mm -hmm. a few years ago. Well, well, I was praying a lot about what to do with this board. And one morning I woke up and I had this very clear message in my brain. These people are like Joseph's brothers. They mean you ill. Trust me. Mm -hmm. And so I said to my husband, you know, I'm not going to fight with these people. I was, a, I was an at-will employee. They could have fired me at any moment. Mm. And I said, no, I'm going to work this out. I'm going to finish some projects I'm working on, and then I'm going to leave. But I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, right after I told the board this, and we worked out an arrangement that I could finish these projects and all that, I was asked to run for the legislature in mm. North Carolina in a district no Republican had ever won. Mm. But they coerced me by saying an intelligent, hardworking woman can win this (laughs) district. (laughs) So I ran and I won. And I enjoyed, but I was in the minority again. And then um, in 2003, there was an opening for Congress and I was encouraged to run and I ran and I won. Mm. Um, So I never had a passion for running. But God has made a way for me at every stage. But it wasn't until I got that clear message Mm. that morning that I realized that God was totally in control of what was happening. And yet all of my life up until that point and since then has really prepared me. It prepared me ahead of time, and it continues to prepare me. And I have God things happen all the time. So my passion really comes from God's encouragement to do what I'm doing. Yeah. And I truly love education, and I enjoy, I enjoy trying to help people gain an education because 
I know that that's the pathway to prosperity. Yeah, no, that's so good. That's actually um, really goes right down our mission here at, at SEU is to, f- to help these students discover and develop their divine design so they can walk in that pathway. And as you said, experiences and things that you went through prepared you. And, uh, and we teach our, our students the same thing that they're going to, especially in, in these four years of, of formative education, they're gonna have the, the privilege to have experiences and be shaped in a way that, yeah, he'll open the door for them. And what's so and fun, that. what's fun about your story is, and this is something we've actually heard a lot, is, the, is how much the, the school board is a gateway into this whole world, right? We've, I've actually, we've heard this from a couple different representatives that we've had on the show, that if you want to get started in politics, if you're feeling a pull there, the school board is, is a unique place. Tell us a little bit about why the, the school board is so unique. And if, and if you're listening to this podcast right now thinking, man, I want to get involved in politics, it's a great place to start. Well, I tell everybody that I talk to a lot of people who say, oh, I want your job Mm -hmm. or I want to be in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And I say, start locally. Right. Now, whether it's school board or maybe you want to get on a planning board, an appointed board, Mm -hmm. but learn a little bit about how government works. And but I think school board is a great way. Now, school boards vary uh, state by state. Our school board had no power to a tax, so all our money we had to beg from the mm-hmm. county commissioners. Mm-hmm. And really, I know we're going to get into talking about the um, National Department of Education, mm-hmm. the federal department, but you'll see over the years, when I was on the school board, I felt like we had a little bit of control over what happened, but I think there's very little now. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not I think school board's a good place to start any elected office at the local level. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could be on the Soil and Water Conservation Board in North right. Carolina. Right. You get elected to those, but you get a sense of how things work. So I think everybody should start at the local level. Now, you occasionally will have somebody in Congress who usually has a lot of money mm-hmm. who can run directly for Congress and yeah. get there. Or sometimes it's just the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. But generally, I think starting at the local level is the way to go. Right, right. And it gives you a taste of, like you said, how government's working while you're still there, right? Because that's when you start reaching your level at the representative level, federal level, and above, even at the state level, there starts becoming physical distance between you and your constituent. What's fun about right. these offices is you're you're working in them in the same community you're right. already in. You can literally yeah. see the effects on your kids, right, as you go yeah. to school. Well, I'd like to say I'm a little different from a lot of representatives. Right. I spend a lot of time with my constituents. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm very, very accessible. Mm -hmm. And people know that. I answer the phone if it rings in the office. I talk to people on the phone. Mm -hmm. I answer all my own mail. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm pretty accessible. But you're right. Not all members are like that. Right, right, right. And it's just a great way to get started. I know you. uh, this is your second time you've been with us here at Southeastern University. And uh, I'll never forget uh, the first time you were here and you uh, pulled out your constitution, uh, and you carry that around, and I see you have that with you here. And, and w- why is that so important for, especially our, our younger generations now, to really understand that and be familiar with the constitution? Well, because it's the basis of our country. It's the mm. basis of all of our laws. I have to tell you, about uh, about a year ago, I was flying home, and a, and a flight attendant started talking. Well, she, I was talking with the person next to me about the Constitution. And the flight attendant came up to me and she said, I cannot believe there's somebody here talking about the Constitution. And I pulled out my pocket copy that I carry with me everywhere I go. And she cried. Wow. She cried. She said, I am so impressed that there are people like you, who, mm-hmm. because she's very conservative. Mm-hmm. We exchange emails occasionally. But it is important for people to see it and to see those first three words, yeah, we the, the people. people, written larger. And that I tell people those are the most important words outside the Bible. Mm-hmm. Because we own our government, but people have forgotten that. They yeah. mm-hmm. have they've been, not been taught the Constitution, and they have l- thought that the, their um, freedom comes from the government. Mm-hmm. And it's the opposite. 
we, through the Constitution, have given our government certain responsibilities. Freedom for, is give, God-given. Mm. It is not coming from the government. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so tell us a little bit about how education has, has played a role in the shaping and how we think about Constitution. And maybe even talk a little bit more about how, you, how it could be the way that we solve this going forward. Well... Um, we don't teach the Constitution yeah. very much. Yeah. We really don't teach about the foundations of our country. We don't teach our history. Mm -hmm. uh, people just don't understand how our government was formed, mm -hmm. um, that we are unique in how we were formed, and that um, it's important that we maintain the basis, of the Constitution and its basis for us to remain a free people. Mm -hmm. And I, it, I think you just hit on something that's so important that a lot of, I know our students kind of miss out until you start really diving into is just how unique the American country is, how unique we are as a country in the history of the world, in the history of place. And even some people get their hair stand up a little bit when you say something like that. But but it's true when you absolutely. look at it. Can you talk a little bit more, more why that's so true? Well, absolutely. And I say that all the time to people. Mm -hmm. This was the first time in 1776, right. it's the first time ever that a people assumed they were free. Yeah. Before that time, they were owned by somebody, mm -hmm. owned by somebody. This was truly radical. And when I talk to students a lot of times, if I'm not asked to give a special speech, I use the Constitution as my text, mm -hmm. and I talk about the uh, all the items in the Constitution and where they came from right. in terms of our revolution against Britain mm -hmm. and um, and the king mm -hmm. and and how he was a despot and we wrote our Constitution to keep that from happening with a president. Yeah. The structure of our government is really brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, we have never had the kind of minds. Again, in our country, I don't believe that we're existent in the 1700s mm -hmm. when our Constitution was written and the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And so what's the number one thing we need to be doing now to continue the work that they started way back then? Explain again the structure of our mm -hmm. government and explain why we are a free people. Mm -hmm. Our freedom came from God, but we set this, the preamble of the Constitution mm. says it all, right. the, the, that we set up this government to, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty yeah. to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be in school, everybody memorized right, that. Right, right. You know, probably fifth and sixth grade, they mm -hmm. memorized that. They don't read it. They don't understand what that means either. Right. Memorizing, it's one thing. Understanding what the words mean is something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so good. Um, tell us a little bit about the priorities of Congress now that Republicans are back in the majority and you serve in a very important role, chair of the Education Labor Committee. Uh, what, what's ahead? Well, we have a pretty uh, hefty agenda at, uh, ahead of us. We're going to be working in several different areas. The uh, committee's name now is Education and Workforce. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are working on both of those areas. We have sort of two divisions within the committee in terms of staff. Mm -hmm. So on education in elementary and secondary, we will be passing the Parents' Bill of Rights. Okay. okay. That will probably be our first major bill because we want parents to have control over their children's education. Yeah. Right. We want there to be transparency in everything that's happening at the elementary and secondary level. So parents should have a right to know what their children are being taught. They should have a right to know what money is coming into the schools and how it's being spent. They should have a right to know that their children are safe. Mm -hmm. They should have a right to know that their children's privacy Mm -hmm. is protected. So there'll be five different areas that we'll be working on in the Parents' Bill of Rights. Then um, in the um, higher ed area, we will be working with um, reforming post-secondary education. Okay. We'll be, we've already, we will introduce a bill called the um, 
uh, real reforms bill, which we introduced last time, that will totally revamp the loan system okay. for college students um, to make it so much better. Right now, President Biden is doing something that's totally illegal, we believe. It's before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. He is trying to transfer the debt owed by students. They willingly took out loans to the American people. He's saying that you, he's going to forgive these loans. Well, somebody gave me a quote. You can't forgive a sin not create, not made against you and you can't forgive a loan that you do not hold. Yeah, that's the true. Biden administration doesn't hold that loan. The American people, people hold that mm -hmm. loan. And so it's really a transfer of debt mm -hmm. from one group of people to another. Uh, President Obama talked about transfer of wealth. Well, in a sense, it's a mm -hmm. backward transfer of wealth. Right. Um, the other thing we will be doing is we will be working on holding institutions of higher education accountable. Mm. We want, again, tr more transparency. Sure. We want students to know when they go to a college how much is it going to cost, how long is it going to take, what are the chances of their getting a, mm -hmm. a job with the degree that they're seeking, and what are they likely to earn. Right. Because we, we want them to understand if they're going to borrow a lot of money, what are the chances of the their paying right, it back. Right. Um, we will do everything we can to protect religious freedom. Right. <clears throat> I know that is an issue of yours. Yep. It's something I have pushed back against for the last four years mm -hmm. with the Democrats in the majority. They have whittled away at religious freedom yep. in education and, yeah. in, and in the employment in those two areas. Uh, the man who is chairman <clears throat> of the committee has said openly that he thinks that religious people hide behind their religious affiliation in order to discriminate against people. Mm. Uh, I don't believe that. I think yeah. that our sincerely held religious beliefs are to be protected. Yes. And yet the federal government is trying to take those away from us right. or impinge upon us um, uh, their beliefs other people's beliefs and say, no, your beliefs are not valid. Our beliefs are. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. So we've been working hard on that. We'll be working on Title IX. That's yeah, going to be another good. interest, another mm -hmm. area of interest. Um, Representative Greg Stubbe from Florida yes. has a bill that's going to be introduced very soon um, to uh, make sure that biological men are not competing with women in sports. So we have a lot on our agenda on the workforce side. We'll be working on uh, reauthorizing a bill called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, where we'll be doing everything we can to help people gain the skills they need to get a good job without a baccalaureate degree. Yeah. Yeah. So we're good. we're going to be extremely busy. Now, under that, um, when you're working on the educational issues, uh, what about reauthorizing the Higher Education Act? Because it hasn't been reauthorized for quite a while, right? Yeah, that's what I'm talking okay, about. Yeah. Okay. Reauthorizing all the, of that. Yeah. All of that. Okay. I gave some mm -hmm. elements of it, but reauthorizing yeah. all Excellent. of that. That's my number one priority. Mm -hmm. There's never been another person in Congress who has the background in education that I have. Mm -hmm. And I want to take those skills and knowledge and hopefully wisdom um, to be able to do the reform. Never before has higher education been held in such low esteem. Right. So I think we have that opportunity. That's not true with schools like Southeastern. Mm -hmm. You're you're bursting at the seams, but uh, there are a lot of other mm -hmm. schools who have low and en lower enrollment, and they should be. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, and it's funny. It's it's interesting because we're here in Florida, right, Central Florida, and everything that uh, the Governor DeSantis is doing with the state school system feels like it's a few steps ahead of.